everyone, where we're going to be talking about your project manager this morning, which is your liver. You've just gone into your second day of detox and your liver is very busy today. It's gone into a different stage of detox. And as it goes through this stage, I'm going to be explaining to you what's happening in your liver. Your liver, I call the project manager because on a job site, all the plumbers come to the project manager, the painters come to the project manager. The project manager is orchestrating the job site. So that's what your liver's doing. It's orchestrating the job site, of course, which is the human body. So a few facts on the liver. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body. And the liver is the only organ in the body that has the ability to regrow. And when you understand the liver, when you understand what it does, and it's the role that it plays, you'll understand why God made it so. You see, cancer cannot get a hold on the body if the liver's working in optimum performance. So those pieces of information alone make it a very important that we human beings know, know something about the house we live in, especially your liver. Your liver is under your right rib, and if it's not happy when you push it, it'll go, don't. Is that right? Very simple test. And you can see that I'm pushing my fingers way up under my ribs there. But I don't have any discomfort at all. If you have any discomfort, no need to fear. You're in a detox and your liver's very happy. Sorry, not very happy because it's very busy. It's very busy helping you to detox. But it, it'll certainly recover. So what I want to do before I show you what the liver's doing today, I want to show you what it does with everything that comes into the body. So environmental poisons coming into the body, everything goes straight to the liver. And if it's toxic, the liver says, whoa, nasty guy, wrap him up in fat and store him. And if the liver looks at it and says, no, nah, we can break that down to a state that can be easily released, that is what it will do. What about food? Let me show you what it does with the food that comes in. And never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many carbohydrates. So we're going to do a carbohydrate assessment. And I want you to tell me what most Americans had for breakfast this morning. Yeah, toast. So here we've got bread. Cereal's a very popular one. One lady said egg. Sorry, no one cooks anymore. Is that right? Donuts. Donuts. Surely not. <laughs> and we talked about the healthiest part of the donut, didn't we? Which is the <laughs> hole in the middle. So we'll say for the donuts, the cakes, the um, you call them biscuits. Do you know what we call biscuits? Cookies. So when we see a sign that says. Biscuits and gravy, we're thinking, oh, these Americans are strange people. They put gravy on their cookies. But I, I realise that I think your biscuit is like a scone, like a, a roll or something like that. So I'm just going to say cakes, etc. So this takes into consideration the donuts, the biscuits, the cakes, the pastries, the pies, all of that. And uh, pizza. When I was a little girl, I didn't know what a pizza was. I... Um, I don't think I knew what a pizza was till I was about 20. So I'm a, a baby of the 50s, 60s, so they weren't really around then. Same with pasta. I don't think there's a home today that doesn't have pasta. Would that be right? And rice is another carbohydrate. Potatoes. That's a high carbohydrate food. And last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. Now, would you agree with me, students, that Americans have become high carbohydrate consumers? Now, I say, I say become because I don't think anyone chose to eat this way. It was just there. It's just easy. We're such a fast society today. And many people don't think about their lunchtime till they're hungry or their evening meal till they're hungry. And there's no time to soak the legumes and cook the legumes. There's no time to steam the vegetables. They just want food now. So I think it's something that is just, you could say, evolved. And it's got to the point where these are very popular foods and we are getting the ramifications of that. And people are starting to think, now what's happening here? What's happening here? The first person that blew the whistle on it really was probably in the 80s, Dr. Robert Atkins. You've heard of Dr. Robert Atkins? Yeah. Now his book, it, it, hit the, it, it hit the press and it became New York Times best-selling cookbook four years running. Wow. wow. The nutritionists and, nutritionists and the doctors hated him. Someone loved him. Who loved him? 
the people. You know why they loved him? It worked. His story is fascinating. He's a GP in his 40s, putting on a bit of weight, and of course that's what this will do. Let me show you why it does it. We'll just take a little, we're going to finish Atkins in a minute, but let me show you. You see, he knew his science, that's why, and the science I'm about to show you. All of these foods break down in the gastrointestinal tract to a singular structure called glucose. Now the glucose goes on the M1 main highway portal vein straight to the project manager. And then the project manager determines where this glucose goes. And it'll take it inside the cell. Remember I promised you we'll be going to the CBD every day? So the glucose goes inside the cell. It goes through a 20-step pathway. The 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. Isn't that why we eat? Now the end result of that 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate is the chemical form of glucose that gets fed into the next section of the cell, often called the powerhouse, because this little eight-step pathway delivers to us a whopping 36 units of energy. So the question now arises, why does a 20-step pathway only give us two units, and why does an eight-step pathway give us 36 units of energy? The difference is oxygen. This is called an anaerobic pathway, anaerobic because it doesn't use oxygen. It produces energy by the process of fermentation. That's where a cancer cell lives. Remember what we looked at yesterday? Doesn't like oxygen, consumes 15 times the rate of glucose because it's running up there. Interesting. 